Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. This is Craig Trilly, and with me tonight is Father Stephen Bigham. Father Stephen, it's great to have you back on. Hi, glad to be here. Now, Father Stephen, this was a big topic. We had a lot of things that stopped us, but we're finally, I'm happy to finally do it, about Romanesque art and the death of Western iconography. It's a very compelling thesis where you portray that the iconography of a given religious tradition kind of conveys the sort of theology that is behind it and that this shows a distancing theology between West and East. So before maybe we unpack the details, uh, I'm wondering maybe if you could kind of summarize that for us and what gave you the idea? Yes. Um, in everything that I say and write, I always start off by saying that Orthodox iconography is a theological art. And that's, everybody's not aware of that, or at least they don't think in terms of that. And it means that the actual painting of icons, or we can even go back in, in church history, I claim that it goes back to actually the beginning of the Christ, of Christian art, that the uh, Christian artists attempted to uh, portray, to represent their faith that icons are not uh, or, or christian imagery is not just another art form uh invented by artists but it is a a, a, a specific artistic language that has been used from the beginning uh, to express the faith of the church um and that is why I say it is a theological art. And in order to understand icons today or even questions uh, in the past, uh, how to interpret certain things, uh, if you do not take that into account, then you're going you're gonna to come up with all kinds of uh, off-the-wall uh, interpretations and ones that uh, couldn't possibly... that that type of an image could not possibly have existed at that time because in back of in back of the image is the christian faith uh standing behind that image so i and how did i come to that well if if you read one of the documents uh from vatican ii uh when it talks when they talk about art it, it's a it says that the, the Roman Catholic Church does not have any particular style or any favorite artists or way of expressing anything. That, in fact, uh, Christian imagery is a question of the artist, the inspiration of the artist, his talent, uh, and that uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church accepts all kinds of styles, all kinds of artists, uh the, the, they change over time and different countries and that continues to that'll continue to change and and who knows in five fifty years a hundred years there will be new artists no, no doubt and that the church the roman catholic church will then uh select those pieces those paintings or whatever uh artworks that she sees as uh, dig dignified and worthy of being placed in the churches so when I ran in, I mean, and that that's all over the place. We have that idea uh, is circulating and is very widespread. As a as an Orthodox Christian, however, uh, I think that 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 notion does not fit with uh, our iconography. Uh, that there has been that the tradition, that holy tradition, as it uh, formed the scriptures. Hmm, the early Christian, the early Christians, the first second, first second century, they didn't walk around with Bibles in their hands, New Testaments. Uh, practically all the documents of the New Testament existed about the year 100, but they had were not gathered together. And out of the great body of literature that that existed, uh, nobody knew exactly what was canonical scriptures that took a long time of filtering out all the crazy gospels and fake uh, letters from the apostles and then finally after several hundred years we all agreed on what is the new testament i i maintain that the same process 
uh, took place in the development of, of Christian art. And that the first Christians, whenever, whenever this happened, we don't, we don't know historically, uh, but someplace and sometime, the Christians ex expressed their faith in a drawing of some kind, in some artistic representation. And at, at the time that they made that image, whatever it was, uh, it, it was intended to reflect their uh, faith. And, uh, and so uh, uh, holy tradition has, through now 20 centuries, has developed uh, and changed and crystallized in certain areas, such as the image of Christ and of the 12 feasts, um, has crystallized into something that is, we can almost say, close to canonical, uh, a canonical image of Christ, just like there's the canonical gospels. There is uh, a great, a large consensus that certain images of Christ, this is, this is sort of the characteristics that it must show in order to be called uh, canonical, uh, kosher, uh, in order that it be accepted, accepted by the church. And if it deviates, somehow it deviates, that an image deviates from that, it is quite possible for that image of Christ, let's say, uh, to be uh, heretical. Uh, we don't often think of, you know, you go to the Louvre or the museum in New York or some other place in London, and you look at the pictures and you think, oh, that's beautiful, it's naive, it's uh, uh, off. So you have all, there's all kinds of uh, criteria for uh, judging a painting. But nobody says that, oh, that's a heretical painting. Who would ever talk about a heretical Rembrandt? Uh, you don't apply, you don't apply uh, theological categories to Rembrandt or uh, you know uh, Picasso or any other, anybody else. Th those are two different and separate uh, areas. But f for us, I say us meaning the or Orthodox Christians, I believe that in fact, because our iconography, our canonical iconography, is a theological art that it expresses in lines and colors uh, our faith that it is in fact possible for an image to be heretical. That means it, if, if the image painted by someone or mosaic, whatever, uh, falsifies or does not express correctly our Christian faith, Orthodox faith, then indeed uh, that those images can be categorized as heretical. Now, that is a very minority opinion in the art world, but that's okay. <laughs> We're, that, it isn't our job as Orthodox Christians to support or, or unsupport uh, their, their theories. But we, I think we have a different point of view that the, from the one expressed in Vatican II, uh, and that is that we do in ha indeed have developed a church art, an art not just somebody's particular style, but we have developed a language, uh, an artistic language that expresses uh, our fundamental faith. And so I wanted to write about that in, its relation, in relation to Romanesque art. Now, what is, and just so people are aware, we have the website, uh, your website below in the info bar. What is the book and where could they find it? Well, you uh, go to my website and it's called, uh, I have it here somewhere. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There it is. It's called Romanesque, <laughs> Romanesque Art and Icons. Uh, with some other studies, uh, and uh, it's available. All you have to do is uh, click on it, and you go to Smashwords, and you can download it or anything else you want for free. If you want to send me a gold brick, okay, I'll accept that. Uh, but most people, you know, the big zero, that's okay. I just want to, you know, let people become aware of of our point of view on on, on Christian art. 
Now, that being said, quoting the book, you say that Christian artists rejected the canon of Greco-Roman art, naturalism, idealism, the beauty of the human body, etc., to adopt a style which some describe as naive, primitive, or even clumsy. So, right, Christian art from the get-go, um, you delineate, really wasn't from Greco-Roman culture. It was right from the get-go different. And then he stated that we suppose there existed at the end of the millennium, even up to 1200, one form of Christian art shared by all theological churches, expressing common faith, but varying through countries and centuries. And so it sounds like you're saying that Christians have always had a different art, um, but even after both the schism with the Oriental Orthodox schism with the Roman Catholics, for a considerable period of time, there existed one noticeable canon of art. And even if there were different localized expressions, Romanesque, for example, or how the Coptics, for example, have certain Egyptian elements like the big eyes and stuff, that what would be recognizable would be the same artistic canon is what yes. you're saying. Now, yes, here's my question to push back against that. And you're the expert, so push all the way back, please. Why was the earliest Christian art diverse and not according to this one form? And so that'd be my first question to you. Why was it uh, different from Greco-Roman? Well, it was different from Greco-Roman, but it was also very diverse. It doesn't, I personally don't well, see it following a canonical norm. And so it sounds like maybe you're saying that the canonical norm developed or the church filtered what was, it certainly uh, uh, you know, uh, beneficial theologically and what was consistent from the art. And then it kind of coalesced into a canonical form. I mean, could you describe that for the viewers? Yeah, that's uh, that. That's my point point of view. Our, our iconography did not, as we know it today, did not come down the mountain with Moses. Uh, you know, it started off uh, uh, probably with a, making a cross. You know, making a cross somehow, or even uh, as we have in the catacombs. Uh, you know pictures of, of, of a mother and a child. Now, at that time, what, what were the, uh, what was the Christian uh, proclamation? The proclamation was that the, the word of God, the son of the father, became man in this woman's uh, womb and was born. And it was for the Jews to, to, to make that picture was sufficient to mark them off from Jewish belief, uh, and that that was quite quite sufficient. Now, as as time will go go by, uh, some of the images that were developed, such you know, like the fish sign or uh, the good shepherd or uh, all various various other ones that were de developed as as time went on, and we could see them in the catacombs. As new controversies came about, such as Arianism or even before that, the Docetism, uh, certain images were judged to be uh, too vague. They didn't, they needed to be made more precise. Something had to be added or changed to uh, adapt uh, and adapt them to, to fight this new uh, heresy. Uh, one, of the, one of the really good examples is that you can see the, the great variety of images of Jesus. And after all, Christ is the center of, uh, of our theology, of our everything. So naturally, the image of Christ is going to be at the center of our, uh, our iconography, of our imagery. Uh, he was shown, uh, Jesus was shown uh, in many cases as a young uh, Greek, uh, beardless, pretty, uh, young man, young boy, teenager, uh, and he and he was shown raising uh, Lazarus from the dead and looking like a young Greek athlete, you know, uh, short hair. And uh, so then, as time went on, you know, the Docetists that in the first couple centuries, those people, Docetism, said that well. Jesus, yeah, we we accept the incarnation. Okay, there's Mary and the child. That, yeah, we accept that. But he wasn't really 
uh, fully uh, a man, a human being, that there's a big difference between what he was and what we saw. Well, if you if you believe, as we do, uh, in, in a real incarnation as a Jewish man, uh, showing Jesus as a, as a young, pretty Greek boy, short hair, no beard, uh, that's a pretty, between what Jesus, who Jesus really was and the image of him, that's a big distance and which opens up a lot of uh, possibility for docetists or others, people who say uh, he only seemed like a real man, uh, to to get in and uh, and make their proclamation. So eventually, the church rejected, just kind of filtered out. I mean, there's no canon or no uh, council that said this, but eventually that image was eliminated, and what is called the Syrian or the mid the Eastern image of Jesus. I mean, he was a real adult. Jewish man. So the images start to reflect that, that real historical uh, actuality. To, now let me words, interrupt here for a second, because because we're going to unpack that in a little more detail in a moment. Okay. So we could see that uh, the art begins cryptic, even idealistic, taking on archetypes that uh, would correspond to certain things from the Greco-Roman world. And so as a, a very precise question to push back uh, um, against that then, against uh, some of what we're hearing here, precisely how was Christian art, like you, you said, it has certain Greco-Roman archetypes, but how was it different, right? Like you said, okay, or was it different because it was purposely being ahistorical and overly cryptic? Like what was the crucial difference? Well, Unfortunately, all we have are the the objet d'art, the actual paintings in the catacombs in uh, Dora Europas uh, and, and some other places. Nobody ever wrote about it. Nobody wrote an uh, an article uh, explaining why Christians are taking this new new art. But there was a new faith, the new faith coming out of, uh, you know, Bethlehem and uh, resurrection and, and, and all that, out into the Greco-Roman world. And that faith could not be theologically expressed by the canon of Greco-Roman art, which was showing physical beauty, showing idealism, showing uh, other things, whatever else. That, that those techniques... And that way of showing things didn't work for, for the new faith. The new faith required new uh, techniques and a new vision of things. And that new vision is very clearly seen in, uh, uh, you know, in the catacombs and, and elsewhere. And that is, it's not the, the Greco-Roman art wanted to, uh, was mimesis. They wanted to show reality as it really was in an ideal form. Well, there was no no attempt to show Jesus, you know, to try to actually make a portrait of him. Uh, look at the, the images of him as a young Greek boy. And they're all with a beard, without a beard, all kind. There was no attempt to make a portrait of him. The, the point was to show him in, in a... In a in a way that was not, that was historical, but yet was eschatological as well. And that is, that is the. So, so yeah, let's zero in on that. The idea was to convey the, even they, like, so there's a diversity in how they went about this, but the idea was to convey that concretely the Lord historically was incarnate. Mm -hmm. But the art itself wasn't to reflect that in a, in an overly naturalistic, overly historical sense. So it's to be historical, but not at the same time to be worldly, but also to convey there's something otherworldly about this. And the word and for as, that is eschato eschatological. So look, we got the art historian giving us the fancy words. And so, yes. And so um, that being the case, that's what I think was in common between these art forms. There's, 
One other aspect, and you could push back against me, that I, I've seen in maybe the few dozen pre-Nicene uh, arts that art that we have extant, is there appears to be something in the art that's supposed to convey power. And I think sometimes the cryptograms and whatnot, um, just like the even the sign of the cross, um, are all like the almost like talisman. And let me explain this for a little bit. Like we know from uh, early Christian homes, instead of having mezuzah near the door, they would have a cryptogram of the Our Father near the door. We know about the um, the Christian fish. We know that they would have uh, impressions of anchors, whether in signet rings or uh, as images. Obviously, the cross itself, the Good Shepherd, which uh, would usually borrow imagery from uh, Roman art of Roman gods, but then meant to repurpose to convey Christ. It almost seems like the idea of all this art was to con was actually to exude some sort of power. And what's your impression? Um, the word is escaping the moment. I'll go look it up as you're talking. But what's, what's your impression of the art serving that purpose, to serve the purpose like a mezuzah, serve a purpose like a talisman? Well, I'm not sure that uh, they thought of these art these representations as uh, conveying a power, but they did attempt to show Christ as, what should we say, having a power. Now we know, we know from, we have images and we can see them where Jesus is shown raising uh, Lazarus. And what is he holding in his hand? Wow. He's, holding, he's holding a long stick, which we call a, a wand a magic wand and doesn't that seem rather strange that the christian artists would show him i mean that's like a magician i mean for us a magic wand is a magician but at the time in the greco-roman world to show that some that a a, a wonder worker was uh, was there and we claim that jesus he had to have a, a wand he would not have been taken seriously if in the image he didn't have a wand uh, so they put a wand in his hand to show that he was indeed a special uh, wonder worker. That, of course, later on, that was not needed anymore, and that, that faded out. Uh, but that was uh, one way in which the image of Jesus was was shown to, that the image showed him, the image, was not itself, but the, it showed Jesus as a powerful uh, person one of the one of the developments too of showing Jesus uh, in raising the status or at least expressing this the higher status uh, of Jesus vis-a-vis -vis other wonder workers of the Greco-Roman world they had there were lots of uh, was to put a halo around his head hmm? now that it now we look on icons of yeah, we don't even think about it. But at the time, the earlier images did not show that. So when you when uh, someone came along and you know denied that he was the divine, fully divine Son of God, uh, how could artists raise his uh, status with an image? And so they gave him a, a, a halo, which was characteristic of the Roman emperors, or they thought they were gods, or of other actual images of gods. Uh, like Apollo specifically, right? A halo uh, specifically, yes. Uh, and, uh, well, that wand, we've kept the halo, but we got, got rid of the wand. Um, another another thing, another symbol was that the, the clavus, uh, that Roman senators and Roman knights uh, wore special, uh, like, it was like a, a deacon wears today, you know, a, a thing over his shoulder. They wore those of different colors uh, to indicate their status in the Roman society. Well, that, if you'll notice, on even today, all the images of Jesus have that uh, clavus. Now, why? what's the point of that? Well, it, it was a symbol of nobility and high status, uh, which the church put on him, which the artists uh, put on him. Uh, not, I wouldn't say to show the power of an image as though it were a, some kind of a talisman, uh, but to, uh, to enhance his 
uh, status to show his importance on a, on a much higher uh, level than any of the other wonder workers uh, uh, around that, that they knew about in, in the Greco-Roman world. Yeah, the, the word I was searching for was apotropaic. Ah, apotropaic, yeah, like meaning uh, a, a magic charm. Of some sort, yes. Yeah, they would. You would wear something to, like the what is it called? The the eye, the uh, the bad eye, uh, the evil well, eye. The evil eye, but evil. but if we think about it, this is not something that Orthodox iconography has completely shed to this day. The idea, for example, an icon to Theotokos could ward off an army, right? There's it's something. Yes, you could pray to Theotokos without the image, but having the image is helpful. And so, and same with the sign of the cross to ward off demons. How is or even, uh, or even wearing a little uh, a little icon? Yeah, I mean, I there's no problem with that. I mean, if you that's no. why my my own personal analysis has to do that the cryptic nature of early art um, connected with the understanding, the canonical understanding that there is an apotropaic element again, not magical. You know the the. It's the, this book actually talks about that icons, um, they don't need to be blessed to, to serve their function. It's the fact they, uh, yeah. they portray something divine or those are undergoing theosis and become divine by grace. That's what gives them the sort of power that they have. But let me quote the book because I think this actually connects what we're discussing right now. You speak of how the first images chosen by Christians during the pre-Constantinian period were judged to be too imprecise to express the faith in the new context. Like you were saying, Gnostics could justify Gnostic doctrines uh, due to the kind of shifting art forms. And so you state that images were to evolve in four directions. Certain images lost their popularity and almost disappeared because they could be interpreted in too many ways. Like the wand. Other images, like the wand, uh, maybe even the... Uh, Christ being de de depicted as a lamb, will kind of need yes, to be yes, yes. Um, Other images uh, were modified to better express orthodoxy, that is to better exclude heretical doctrines. Uh, new images were created, and old elements were combined to form new associations. And so precisely with all this in mind, what was the impetus that helped this art develop into one form, one canon, and what gave it a sort of permanent status? Okay, the the impetus, just as in theology, in in our rational expression of our faith in writing, is has basically been uh, pushed along. The, the motor of it has been the uh, the uh, the fight against uh, heresies. People who come and say, "Well, we believe that this and this is is the case is true," and the church reacts to that and says. No, that's that have a council and they have a canon or somebody writes a thesis uh, and be, then that person or the canon become the expression of orthodoxy at the time. You know, this is it's it's not the ortho it's not orthodoxy that has changed, but the expression of the orthodoxy has changed mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, after Arius, for example, was no longer possible absolutely excluded to talk about Jesus or the word of God as being a creature that was just out before that time. Well, there are some authors who seem to go in that direction. Others go in another direction, but after Arius, no one can say, uh, gee, the, the word of God is, um, is created. And you must say in order to be Orthodox, you must say homoousios. That's just, that's what you have to say in order to be, Orthodox. If you refuse to say that, then you're something else and go have a nice day or whatever. But so just to just to clarify for the audience, because some of the audience might get a little confused, it's not that earlier fathers would deny conceptually that Jesus Christ is the same essence as God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, but that the theological terminology hasn't been clarified so that way they would express that concept in that sense. Is that what you're getting at? That's what we say, uh, we, I say orthodox, orthodoxy, is that there is indeed a development through history. Uh, but the development is not in the doctrine. 
it is not in the experience of Christians in theosis and divinization. It is in, in the, the seeking of uh, words and concepts that answer at a particular time uh, a, a particular heresy. Uh, the, the the ecumenical councils and, and other councils before that were not called just to have a you know drink coffee together and they couldn't think of anything else to do that day. They were called to answer a particular heresy. In this case, in the first case, uh, Arius and the images then, which up to that time had been fairly uh, there were been, there were a lot of examples. The images then also had to become more precise. And that's when we see uh, a halo uh, uh, around Christ's head. We see him also represented in mosaics, uh, sitting on the throne uh, with angels around him. Angels are uh, indications of, of a much higher uh, status. He's sitting on the throne with the apostles in the heavenly Jerusalem. I mean, the you, you can almost say uh, nobody ever wrote that, but you can you can almost see that as an answer to Arius, who made him made Jesus uh, a creature like us. But uh, the church had to counter not only in the word and in writing, but also in imagery, and that meant that certain images of Christ had to had to be had to be changed or adapted, and uh, certain features. Uh, had to be added. I mean, one one really good example. Uh, how many uh, the Gnostics, for example, said, uh, you know, well, I mean, it's like Muslims uh, today uh, and and other Docetists, you know, who was crucified on the cross? Oh well, Jesus. Well, maybe Jesus, but you know, really somebody that looked like Jesus, or maybe it really wasn't him. It was something else. Somehow, something. You know. So, what did the church do? to alter the imagery of, of Jesus to proclaim that, yes, indeed, this person, the real Jesus, died on the cross. And what do we see developing? And that is in the halo, uh, a cross is made. Huh? Or in some, some cases, there's a cross very close to, to Jesus' face. But generally, uh, there's been a cross put into the uh, halo which is to say, well, no, this person, this man died on the cross. So that you people who say he didn't or was somebody else, you know, okay, you are no longer orthodox. You cannot be loyal and true to the apostolic preaching and say that or take the cross out. And so after that point, now the cross becomes part of the standard of uh, images of Christ. And, and this is absolutely fascinating how that you say how that conveys the word of God was crucified for us because it shows that the art as the theology gets clarified, the art gets clarified to reflect the theology. But I would say the consistent um, the consistency with earlier art is, again, where there's was there literally a halo around Christ's head, right? Was there literally angels when he's, you know, yeah. Sitting, uh, sitting with his wife and things like that, visible because there's always sitting, sitting with whom, with his wife. Jesus, Jesus was his, sitting with his wife. His mother. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. We, well, we're again, no, and the wife we're is the bride, the bride of God's the church. I just say can't myself. delete that. <laughs> the bride of God's the church, but yes, with his mother. So, okay. the, so the point is, like you say, you could see the art get clarified to convey that, yes, God really was man, right, against docetism, but you still see these otherworldly elements retained. But the, I guess almost through trial and error, through experience, through the Holy Spirit guiding the church, we see yeah. the, a distillation so that way all the essentials are kept in the art, right? And yeah, so during right. this distillation process, could you explain to us how does the Syrian style win out over the Greek and Roman style? And what's the significance of this? Well, the, the whole point of the, of the gospel is to tie the activity of God to history. I mean, Judaism, uh, even Islam, and uh, certainly us, Christianity, you know, we, we are a historical religion. We're not, 
mythology up there, you know, someplace uh, un, untied to history. That God acted in history at a particular time in a particular place, and He did, uh, He did something. What was that? That's what that's what that link to history uh, is absolutely necessary. Uh, we can, if you break that, then we float off into all kinds of esotericism and, uh, and and crazy stuff. So, if 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 it is important, if you declare that God became man. A Jewish man, about 33 years old, and you show him as a Greek, a young Greek guy, beardless teenager. There's there, there's a certain kind of clash there. Uh, people will say, "Well, wait a minute. You said he became, and then you he became a Jewish guy, and then and then you show him as a as a a Greek, uh, a handsome, pretty Greek guy." I mean, so, there's there's something wrong with that, and eventually the church, yeah, yeah, that that's true. We we want to be, the gospel is what we preach and say is true to history, and so the the preaching in images that also has to be true to history, and so that the image of Jesus as a young Greek boy that that just that had to, that washed out because it wasn't. It wasn't. It left in. It left in the possibility of too many uh, misinterpretations. And Jesus was shown with long hair, with a beard. Uh, I mean, like any Jewish man, he didn't. You know, he was Semitic, so he looked like what Semitics probably looked like. But we we don't actually know what he looked like. But we can certainly know that he didn't look like a young Greek boy. Um, and it was that unconscious you know nobody wrote anything about it nobody uh, put it out in a, a, a some kind of a document or an article it just the church sort of instinctually I, and i think much of the development and the, the and the movement is uh, is instinctual and only when somebody comes along and and makes a statement that contradicts something that has just been going on for instinctually Ah, then we sort of wake up. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, we've been doing this for a long time. So now we have to we have to bring the instinctual, the instinct up to the level of uh, rational speech and say what we've been doing all the time and that certain things are not uh, are not acceptable any anymore. Uh, that unless you have a Question well, let me ask you this, because it might help people understand um, how these, this decision was made. What, in your view, is the implicit philosophy of canonical Christian art? The, the fundamental idea, just like the gospel in words and in writing, is the kingdom of God. That G Jesus preached the kingdom of God. And that the kingdom of God is here, yes, in this world, but it's it's eschatological, pardon. Uh, it's at it's at the end of time too, outside of history, in history, and outside of history. And so the images, in order to portray that uh, that war, uh, the eschatological element, could not reflect to just the world as we see it. You know, perspective. That's that's one of the big things that. Uh, you know that lines, uh, railroad tracks uh, meet at at a distance way out in in, in front of you. Uh, that's part of our world. You know that's that's an element of our world. There are all kinds of other uh, light uh, shadows, and and all of those things which were elements of the Greco-Roman art, they were rejected. So you don't get perspective in er, in Christian art and in icons. You don't see shadows. Why? Because shadows are part are uh, are part of our world. The sun makes shadows, or lights, or lights up. You know, make shadows. But in the kingdom of God, there there are no sources of natural light, and so He is the only light, and therefore there aren't any shadows. And so you well, we can tell one of the one of the telling elements is uh, in the in the shift in Western art away from iconography. The iconographic uh, 
canon, shall we say, is when uh, perspective comes into effect. When shadows are shown uh, in order to reflect our world, the naturalism of our world. That's what, that's what they wanted, uh, the Renaissance uh, painters wa wanted to do, reflect had a religious subject, but they wanted to reflect it, to paint it as it was uh, probably happened in, the, or as they imagined it at the time of Christ. Now, let me ask so, this then, because I think it's going to kind of get into whether the change in artistic form decisively shows theological change or not. Does art always have to reflect guiding philosophical principles? Is it possible just to make art because you like how it looks, or maybe you like more diversity like the early church had, and but yet still maintain those guiding philosophical principles. Well, again, we're not we don't talk about art. Huh? We talk about Christian images, which is as you know, in terms of art history, is a subcategory of images, all kinds of images and art things. But uh, Christian images, uh uh, canonical Christian images have to be uh, seen and interpreted in the light of uh, the the th the theology of the people who who created them, and uh, th this fundamental desire to show our world, people, uh, events in the light of the kingdom, not in the light of the sun or of light lamps or or whatever in our world, but in another world, in, in the light of another world. That's the eschatological element, the end of the world, shall we say, element. And so that has, that has, that drive has uh, eliminated many of the elements and techniques, uh, you know, of, of modern painting or of the Greco-Roman world too, because the new faith needed new techniques and a new vision to uh to show to show the faith if you notice uh in the uh, catacomb paintings in duro Europas and others there's no background or very little background you know they don't show trees and mountains and and a lake and uh, people on boats and stuff like that. that is not nobody cares about that we don't want to see the background who cares what we want to see is if it's a image of Jesus, we want to see the Lord uh, in his majesty, uh, either in a, a, you know, a portrait icon, or see him doing the things that he did during, during his lifetime. And the background, you know, that's, that's of little, little, little importance. So when you see, as you will see in in the post uh, Romanesque art in uh, Gothic and Renaissance and, and new, uh, neoclassic, all that, they, they go to great, ex great effort to show the background, you know, the mountains, the city of Jerusalem, uh, you know, all the different people all around. Uh, you, you, uh, you can immediately sense, that, whoops, whoa, they have lost the eschatological element and they are looking at jesus the crucifixion for example or any any biblical illustration they're looking at that in, in totally in terms of this world and i have often thought this is a theory on my part that when the christian west uh, medieval catholicism and uh, after and up to our time reoriented its theology into this world and you can clearly see that in the art that came out of the renaissance and started in the gothic period statues were then introduced and accepted into christian life where we have never uh, bas relief is is the most that you can get away with. Uh, we have stayed with two dimensionals because what is a statue? You can walk around a statue, you know, David in uh, Florence there or any of the other great statues. You could, in a boat, you can go around the Statue of Liberty and look look at her in, in three 
from all the different angles. Well, that's our world. That's what things are in our world. But we do not want to see Jesus or anybody else shown in our world. We want him to, we want to see him or the mother of God or Christmas or whatever it is uh, in the light of the kingdom of God. Therefore, the techniques, one of which is uh, no background, uh, no shadows, uh, no perspective, or, or have various perspectives that can clash. Uh, and like the nativity. Uh, yeah. Huh? Like the nativity icon. Yes. Like the perspectives are all <laughs> converging, and, and and time as well, time yes. as well. It's you can have people from various periods in an icon. You can have uh, various spaces also in in an icon. So uh, there's a, a rupture with the standards of our world, and an introduction of the eschatological element of the end of the world or the kingdom of god uh and and how do you and like i said oh yes for the for the statues whereas uh, uh a two-dimensional uh representation is actually a distortion already because it's a we have a three-dimensional world portrayed on two dimensions so you you can't walk around the back of the icon and 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 see and see the icon, you know, you only see it from the front uh, with no depth and uh, various other uh, techniques. Uh, and so that preserves, that has preserved for us, the reason we have, we have not adopted statues is because they are three-dimensional. They are our world. We see a statue of Jesus and he's just, you know, we can walk around him and see him. We, okay. But we don't want that. We want to see Jesus in the light of the kingdom of God. Now, in light of what we just uh, heard here, how is Romanesque art similar to canonical art? And how is it different? Because it seems like you make the argument that Romanesque is acceptable. It starts You start seeing the divergences, but overall, it maintains the guiding philosophy that you were just speaking of. So yeah. how is it canonical yeah. and how is it different? Well, if you if you know uh, Romanesque art, and if, in case everybody isn't totally aware of what Romanesque art is, Romanesque the period of Romanesque art is for Western Europe, England, France, Italy, the whole of Western Europe, from about the year eight hundred to maybe twelve hundred, and we have lots of uh, lots of uh, paintings and lots of uh, artistic forms uh things that have been created that are from that period and if you and i i begin my study i say i ask the question if you know romanesque art and you know icons have you ever wondered why somehow they they look they look and feel similar you kind of you kind of smell it's like an incense or something i've smelled that incense someplace else but it's a little bit different um and why and where is, is it, if you look at renaissance painting by uh, duccio and uh, and rembrandt and uh, michelangelo you know you don't feel any you know there's like two different worlds there but you don't get that impression when you look at uh art uh, romanesque art and I wanted to try to uh, raise that intuition, that feeling, to a level of uh, of, into, uh, of intellectual statement, and give a reason for that. Uh, now, it's based on ex one of my experiences. I went on a, a trip uh, for for Romanesque art in uh, one one time all over southern France and Spain, and we went to uh, Madrid. Yes, and there they have a big museum of uh romanesque art and we were in a going in a hallway and then it went into a hall and we turned around and and up on the front like on a, the apse of a church was this giant i mean it was like an apse image of christ and if you've looked on uh in you know in art history books 
it's, it's there. Oh, hey, wow. That is what I saw, you know, turning from, from a sort of dark corridor in, and had this in front of me. Not literally and, this picture, right? The one on screen. <laughs> I, I think, I think that is the one. I think I guessed one, very if, well. <laughs> if, you, if, if that's not the one, a very similar one, and I was so if it's not the one, will you eat my hat <laughs> with ketchup and mustard, please? There you uh, go. <laughs> and I was so uh oh, I I had to hold myself from you know getting down on my knees and say, Lord, I I I how. Now, if you look at that image and you know icons, you can obviously see that that's not a Byzantine, it's not Russian, it's not Egyptian. It's a different style, but you could, any Christian at the time, let's say the year 1000, that saw that image would immediately know what that was. Look, you can see the, the Alpha and the Omega. Those are specific signs you can see the cross the halo the cross he's uh he's giving the blessing or speaking to us he's sitting on a he's sitting on the uh, a, a curved throne there the representation of the world the angels are angels are all around him he's christ in glory i mean okay it's not a russian icon it's not from andrew rublov but lord have mercy i i was i'm I'm struck by the uh, the similarities. Now, my explanation for that intuition is that the there was a development up uh, in the first millennium, in the first thousand years, and even farther on, uh, 1200 maybe before Gothic really got into uh, got going. That that the Roman East Western Europe. Uh, from 800 to about 1200 was part of this what i call ecumenical art ecumenical expressions in painting and mosaics and frescoes and things that expressed the the faith both east west north south uh expressed the 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 common faith of all christians up to that time now uh, Look at this, that would be our image we see here. Uh, that certainly you can find other ones in mosaics, you know, Byzantine ones that are obviously different, but uh, th this one I think expresses in a style, a local style, that of Spain, France, England a bit, Germany, Italy, uh, expresses that common faith that we had, that we all shared together, east and west, until, and this is from the Orthodox point of view, until the uh, Latin medieval west went off on a different path and adopted scholasticism. Uh, now, now, let's, you know, we're going to unpack that in a second and get into like how Gothic starts changing. But with this Romanesque piece that's in front of us now, and perhaps maybe different pieces, what starts? Is there anything slightly off about Romanesque art in your view, or would you say it's it's with just like Russians different than Greek, which is different than Macedonian? Well, that there'd be nothing wrong about Romanesque. It's just a legitimate local expression within the ecumenical art, you know, Christian uh, image form. That is my point of view. That's what I try to defend, that it is a local expression of the ecumenical art, which all See, Christians at the time could, could recognize. So nothing deficient about this whatsoever. Well, now I was, uh, while I was, if you look closely at it, um, does it have Jesus's name? Now it does have Alpha and Omega, which is a kind of symbolic, it's not really his name, but I'm trying to see if anywhere it says Jesus Christos. And uh, I, I, I can't see it. If, there, if it is there, I can't see it clearly to, uh, to identify who, 
uh, who this person is. However, if the name isn't there, it certainly is Alpha Omega. And that for any for any Christian who knows the scriptures, well, we know who the Alpha and the Omega is from uh, that is Christ. Now, um, I notice, well, what uh, what is there anything else that would uh, would be of a shock? I don't I'm trying to look just at this image. I mean, the angels are kind of funny looking, but, you know, OK, uh, they're angels, obviously. Um, I can't see it. I mean, uh, if, if you look at the whole range of, uh, of uh, Romanesque art, one thing that it, one thing that did start to uh, show itself in, in Romanesque art, and that is uh, three three dimensional statues of, of, of the Virgin that did start to appear in the uh, Romanesque period. Uh, which was, but that it wasn't very developed, and even there was some protests. Uh, oh my goodness, uh, that's like a, that's like an idol. That's a three-dimensional thing, and but it went on and was adapted and uh, became a part of uh, Western Catholic, uh, and even in some cases Protestant. Um, but the the point is that Romanesque art is a local expression, in my opinion, a local expression of the ecumenical art that all Christians at that time could look at and recognize. They would know that it's different, but they would be able to read it. Now, what I find fascinating is when this starts changing, okay? And so what I want to ask then is, what were the series of developments in post-Romanesque art, particularly Gothic, before? Because once we get the Renaissance, it's so different. You know, there's clearly nothing connecting it to anymore. But like, how is how did the how did Gothic art develop, and what makes it wrong? So like, while you start explaining that, I'm gonna put a, a piece on screen, and hopefully, uh, I have a good example. So you know, how does Western art continue to develop, and what's what did they start getting wrong? Well, uh, in it depends on when the time, but by the let's say 1200s, you've got the adoption of uh, scholasticism and and uh, Thomas Aquinas and uh, Aristotle as uh, the the philosophical foundations of Christian faith, and they begin to express uh, in theology uh, points of view that are. Uh, you know, different from different from the common tradition that uh, that was of what we call of the fathers, um, and that they will begin to show. I, do you know the date of this image right here? This is in the fourteen. This is in the fourteen hundreds in Spain. Yeah, well, that's that's already into the, uh, going into the Renaissance. Well, look, look one one good example. Look at look at the halo. The halo now in. in in an icon or in earlier uh, images, the, uh, you, you have the impression that there is a light uh, encompassing the whole head of the person of Christ or the saint. That it's like a, 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 a glow all around his head or her head. Now, if you look at that, you've already got, you have a plate. The halo is a plate. In back of Jesus's head, you can you can see that there is there is a space. You can't see the space, but you can imagine the space between the back of his head and that plate. Yeah. That is that shows distance. That shows perspective. That shows that Jesus is closer. His head is closer to us than this plate. And of course, all the other ones. The cross is farther back, and uh, the horses are farther back, and the men are farther back, and. Everything is is farther back. And look off, up in the corner up here. You see a, a bridge and a river and people crossing and the bridge. People crossing the bridge. You, you, you see the beginning of perspective of showing a background. Uh, and well, I mean, who cares about a bridge? You know, in the river, we don't. And you know, all of these horses and these men and well, is that is that what we want to see in a in an icon of Good Friday? No. But they began to incorporate all of these uh, elements 
to create a new uh, a new style. Now, I I I claim that because Christian art is theological, there is in back of this image and other and all the other images there is a change because there was a change in the art. There was a change in the theology as well. So what's what's the theology here? Um, yeah, that was in... All right, listen listen to this. Uh, we say the patristic tradition says who who speaks and who manifests himself in the Old Testament according to Orthodox patristic theology. Who is that? Who speak who spoke to Moses? Who spoke to Adam and Eve? And the answer is. Oh, you're posing it to the audience. <laughs> well, anybody, anybody that wants to say. And the answer is. We're talking about Jesus Christ. Oh, of course. Of course. The, the, the holy tradition, the fathers, unanimously, except for one, I'll tell you about him, uh, except for one, uh, saw the in the in the theophanies in the old testament the logos as an as a uh, as a prefiguration of the incarnation of christ so in in all in the old manuscripts of uh, illuminated bibles when they show the the creation who do they show as uh, as creating adam and eve who do they show as uh, pulling eve out of uh, the uh, adam's side it is all this. We recognize him as Jesus. All the characteristics of the of the historical Jesus that have come to be uh, associated with the canonical image of Jesus, they are transported back into the uh, creation scene, because the only possible image of God in the, our tradition and the patristic tradition is the incarnate logos. There is no other, no other possible uh, image. So that all, if you, if you look at all the illuminated Bibles from the Armenia to, uh, you know, the West, North, South, it's always Christ that is shown. And in the development after, uh, after Romanesque art, the, uh, <clears throat> The theology changes to say that it is God the Father who is the main actor in the Old Testament, and that there's a development there. You can read about it in the art in the in the book. Then the art, because the the theology has changed, the art then changes. And who do they show? Michelangelo. Who do they show as creating Adam and Eve, as talking to Noah, Noah, as uh, talking to Moses, as all the in all the Old Testament theophanies, they they change from from Christ to images of God the Father. Now, now it, before, it, before we get there, because I think well, doesn't well, that well, get well, into well, a, a, a very important point. A very sure. important point. If you go to Chartres, if you go to Notre Dame, if you go to the great cathedrals in Western Europe, most of them built in the 12, 11, 12, 1300s, and you look at their scenes of the creation, because they, they sculpted the Bible and they, they sculpted, you know, uh, like over the wall, over the doors, they sculpted images of the creation. And who do they show creating Adam and Eve? Who? Not God the Father, but Christ. It's very clear with a with a halo with a halo and a cross in it. It's very clear that at that time the people who built the great cathedrals of Western Europe were still living on the roots of the common patristic. Uh, theology and iconography. They put them into the cathedrals of, of Western Europe. And we could say, aha, huh? Well, you guys, well, why did you put in God the Father when your own cathedrals show that Christ was the one who revealed himself in the Old Testament, in the Theophanies? Uh, 
and th there you see very clearly you see that they were still living according to the their co our common roots and it was only even after art is always slower than the theology to develop it was only later that that in the creation images it wasn't christ the logos is a pre prefiguration of the incarnation but it was simply god the father and that that is a very clear in, in my opinion it's a very clear announcement that western europe medieval latin christianity catholicism theologically and artistically went on a different path than the one that was taken by our common east and west ecumenical roots and we can we in the east shall we say uh, continued for many centuries reproduce living and painting on the roots our common roots whereas western europe latin catholicism went on a very different road theologically and artistically and it's visible you can see it all you have to do is go to those places and it jumps out at you if you have eyes to see then go see now uh, in the form the art form we have on screen if i share uh, it again good it's there yeah it's here's what i this is a beautiful thing about art right we can all look at art here's what i see that could be problematic like as you say there's a distance in he, halos of christ's head and the halo and that almost has a somewhat nestorian element right that the that the man Christ is different than the divine Christ. And we could also see with the three-dimensional, there's a sort of attempt to make it look like that this is realistic, right? Yeah. This is a realistic procession of people. The, you're seeing the horses at an angle. You see a sort of three-dimensional images. Unlike the Renaissance art, it appears to lack linear perspective. So it really doesn't fully draw you in. I'm not sure if that was on purpose from the artist or just a lack of the expertise. Uh, well, you, in your perspective. you can certainly see perspective in uh, that there are various layers. There's Jesus is uh, in front and his leg is farther, cl is closer to us than his body, than his other leg. And then you've got the he his head and then back in back of that at a distance is the halo in back of that is the cross in back of that then is this guy you can see him the horses and uh and then way back in the back is the the scene in the corner uh of the bridge and and the river yeah there's, there's certainly perspective but it seems to be uh, a lack of linear perspective there's uh, uh, yes, several that, focal focal points of yes, that, uh, the three dimensions so it gives yes, it a that, artificial that, that's true that's true but you can certainly see in here in this image the various layers away from the front of the uh, of the painting now i think the the redeeming quality of this image which is why i think they try to do something good but it, you know the if someone were to take your thesis the, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions is that the theological point is that christ died for us even today right so to someone looking now in the 21st century, this looks like a million years ago. But to someone in the 15th century, they would have clearly identified that the people imaged here aren't from the first century. They would have been from their day. So we could see yeah. Um, yeah. castle structures, bridge, a bridge there, even someone nonchalantly walking across, right? Stuff from the 15th century, from what that from that day would have been the modern day, from just us living our daily lives. And then we can even see the soldiers, the one kicking Christ there, the ones coming after him. They they appear as soldiers would have appeared in that day. And they weren't stupid. It's not like they didn't know what soldiers at least sort of looked like in the past because they had all their art where some of these things were pictured. But they were deliberate in trying to portray that Christ died for us even now. I think that's the theological point being conveyed here. It's a good theological point. But in so doing, they almost... Uh, they, they miss that guiding principle where there's a human Christ, a humanized Christ per se, but there needs to be something otherworldly, something eschatological. And that is lost in the pursuit 
of showing how Christ died for us today in this particular art form here. So that would be my synopsis. I wonder just what your thoughts on that are. Well, I, you know, uh, we don't know who the artist was, but all we can do is analyze the, his work uh, or her work. I guess it probably was a him. Uh, I would not say that the art, the intention of the artist was to show that Jesus died for all of our sins. That I, I don't think they were. Um, I don't think they were working with theological con concepts and attempting to project those into uh, uh, into their paintings. I think they were motivated. And this becomes clearer and clearer as, as time goes on. They were motivated to show a religious subject, that is, Jesus carrying his cross, to, to simply illustrate that, to show it according to their uh, according to the artistic uh, talent of the of the artist, and according to the to the uh, his day, the way things were in his day, yet putting Jesus into that and uh, representing Jesus on the on the way to Golgotha. I mean, look look at his clothing. I mean, nor, usually in, in, in the canonical image of Christ, his clothing is one of a, a, a blue or dark uh, tunic representing his humanity and then representing his divinity and then covered over by uh, another cloak uh, representing his, his his humanity and here what is this that he's wearing i mean i'll have to look really close to see i mean it looks like well it looks like something you'd wear in the theater a costume uh, of some kind i mean what what is that why is he wearing that i don't know uh and you can see already too another element that you're gonna that is going to creep in and look at his face it's already uh, kind of showing uh, pain and suffering and uh, oh, uh, uh, uh. whereas in an icon, you know, we we don't want we want to see Jesus. Even Good Friday, even on the cross, the crucifixion, we don't show Jesus and the crucifixion as it was on Golgotha, as though there were you know cameras there to take pictures. We want to see. Golgotha, we want to see Good Friday in the light of Easter. So we don't want to see Jesus, and this will be this will be introduced into Renaissance and other art, you know, where you see, oh, he's suffering and blood is all over the place and gushing, and uh, skin is oh, it is terrible. It goes, you know, it's, Lord have mercy. We don't want to, that's that's you know. Uh, did you see the movie? Uh, one of them was uh, what was it? And Passion of Christ or War of the Worlds? I saw both. Uh, I think it was the first one there. Uh, you know, and Jesus was showing oh, more blood, the better, you know. And, and some images of Latin America, you know, the better. Well, you know, it's it's interesting you bring that up because in this uh painting and it's, it's showing the pain of the crucifixion. And I'm going to now share a different painting. And when you think of, this is going to be another Gothic painting, which uh, in some respects looks more like Orthodox iconography, is there's a Orthodox doctrine that was really underappreciated called economic conversation, lack of a better term. It's Christ voluntarily suffer, suffering in death. He didn't have to. He had no sin. He didn't have to suffer and die, but he voluntarily assumed the blameless passions and death um, for to pretty much conquer death for us. And so when we look at art, we don't usually, we don't see Christ bawling. We see him suffering, but in a measured sense, because the idea is that voluntaristic element, that control ultimately he had over the passions. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, that's a, a doctrine whenever, for example, this is beyond you, Father, but uh, I'm published in Mariology, and that seems to be the big thing that in Western theology, no one could grasp, especially the doctrine of Immaculate Conception. What are the blameless passions? How was Christ's experience of the blameless passions? 
et cetera. That's why even early heresies like apartodocetism would make no sense to modern Western people studying them. And so what's my point in bringing this all up? Um, the point is that because the Western society and the art and the movies like Passion the Christ um, just portray Christ like as, as a man, almost like a sinful man with no control over, um, over pain and suffering and death, that the intention, like I said, was to make Christ like us and to make him approachable. But what it has done, it's creates distor this distortion of what is sinless humanity like? How did Christ atone for our sins mm. in his experience from the incarnation to death and the resurrection? Now, when we look at this other Gothic piece from the uh, 13th century, so it's a little earlier, it has the image of God the Father in it, which we know how, how much you're against this. Um, and so like the just, Gothic just art. Just me? Just me? Well, it's in the book. So <laughs> I'm against it too, personally, by the way. Okay, but, okay. But that, I'm not here to endorse it. Okay. But that aside, right, we see the introduction of God the Father and Gothic art like we see in this piece. And do you see oh, the Holy Spirit there, the dove? in The, the Holy Spirit is a dove. Yeah. But we do see Christ on the cross, right? Like, Because, again, it's not like when it became Gothic, all of a sudden all the iconographic canonical norms just disappeared. Christ yeah, on the cross right. here looks very similar to an Orthodox Christ on the cross, a very measured crucifixion and experience of death as compared to what we were seeing in the other later Gothic image where it almost looks Renaissance. It almost looks like Passion the Christ, how mm -hmm. they portray Christ's suffering. So it's a, it's a very interesting, as we can see, development in that. We can also see that uh, the Theotokos has blonde hair which is also an interesting yeah. development there. So what are yeah. your what are your impressions of what we see here? Okay, uh, can you raise up uh, the, to see his feet, to see Jesus' feet? Yes. It still has the single, it has only a okay. single, okay. Uh, yeah. There we go, that's good. Now, you were perfectly correct in, in saying that it wasn't like you switch the light on or switch the light off, that it was a gradual, I call it a drift, gradual drift away from the the common uh ecumenical expression uh art of the first century the first millennium toward this new renaissance uh, and gothic or renaissance it was a slow movement so you see very very clearly here look at yes you have christ's body is almost uh, uh an s Huh? It, uh, all, it's, it, it, his head leans to the left, then his body goes down and leans to the right, and then his feet go down and, and legs go down and to the right. That's very classic. That's uh, and he and he's not shown, you know, in in terror. There's no blood gushing out all over the place. There's no uh, he, he he's dead. Uh, so he you know our our salvation has been accomplished. Uh, he said, "Now, now it is finished." And then he died. So his head, and you see the 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 halo with a cross in it, uh, and his his body is very schematic. It's not uh, you wouldn't say if you want if you want a realistic image image you you certainly wouldn't have that. But what one thing that you can that I can say if you be very close, pay attention. Look at his feet. Now, if you look at uh, Romanesque art and our icons and, and everything, you will, you will nearly always see on the cross, Christ crucified, you will see the two feet together like this. And, two, and a nail here and a nail here. In uh, medieval art, as it goes on, you see that the two feet are crossed and one nail uh nailing both feet now you can see down there that they're they're sort of, it's, it's a kind of an in between between having feet uh parallel like this and having it uh with one nail going through you it's almost uh you see one nail and they are uh nailed together but there's a sense that they're two separate uh, you will notice that. Take a look at, uh, that's just one thing to notice when you're looking at uh, 
Christian art. How does uh, how are the feet if they're if they're like this with two nails? It's it's before. If they're crossed like that, then it's uh, for sure uh, medieval Renaissance or or Gothic uh, Gothic things. But yes, that truly that image of Christ could easily be uh, in an Orthodox church. Very now it's it's interesting because I think. Again, beauty of art, we can all interpret art, um, is we see a lot of this the same motivation in Gothic art here in this earlier form to kind of portray the imminency in the modern day, per se, of, of the Lord and what he's done. And so, for example, you could see in both the Theotokos and St. John, their clothing has lots of folds. And then we see the arches and the columns there is this attempt at perspective here of three dimensions. Yes. It, it's, yes. There's layers also we could see near the Father's feet how uh, Jerusalem is kind of you know a messy 3D, certainly not linear perspective. Um, but we could see there, there's that same motivation, right, that, which is lacking in um, proper Romanesque art and the canonical art. Um, we can start seeing those differences here. So even though it's recognizable, it doesn't – look like modern art per se, doesn't look like Renaissance art, we could start seeing that the, those same sort of motivations, which would end up leading to humanizing Jesus and the saints and making um, pretty much the, making things very realistic. And now in the modern day, we've just lost anything with <laughs> anything with art. That's a different story. Uh, now we have all sorts of uh, blasphemous things Completely you, uh, you can see. Look oh. at the uh, look at their the the folds you mentioned. Uh, yes, um, and as the time goes on, even in our art, you you'll see uh, in uh, what's it, uh, the Baroque time. Im I say images, icons, Baroque icons. Certainly, Baroque art in general. There will be flowery. They will be decorated. Every every little space will be decorated with all kinds of doodads and colors and flowers and and just an overkill. And our artists, our art. I say artists. And I'm not sure I want to say iconographers. Uh, you know, in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, when they look back, oh, oh, well. You know, Italy, oh, Western Europe, the great artists, that's where art is, you know. Oh, so look, look at what we paid. Oh, it's not like that. Uh, so we better change it. So they they introduced into icons, you know, clothing that that looks very baroque and as and as is as uh, decorated as as possible. Uh, yeah, but is that's not I mean, we don't want our attention. I mean from the point of view of icons, we don't want our attention drawn to the clothing that the people are wearing. We want to be drawn to the, the person that is shown there. And actually, look, another good thing here, look at the, the proportion of the heads to the entire image. Can you raise, the, raise it up again? Raise it. It's as high as it goes. And that's no, 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 no. Go the other way. Go the other way. Now look. Now from here, from her head down to her feet, what that's however long that is, what percentage of that is of that space is taken up by her face? Actually, a very small, a very small percentage. It's the same thing over here. And we're seeing all of the rest of his body and his uh his clothing. And what's the most important element in an icon? Face. The face. The face of a person. And so here we're, we, have, we have relatively small faces and lots of, lots of space with clothing and uh, this, that, and the other and irrelevant material. I mean, we don't, we don't care what basically what they're wearing. Uh, we want to try to have communion through uh, through the eyes with the person represented and uh this uh even you can see you can see a little bit in the throne uh, here a little bit of baroque it's beginning to be really carved and uh, uh and down here uh, what the bottom part of the throne you know it's starting very to be very, very ornate 
and very, uh, yeah, you know. I here's I think the big detail is look how the father is holding the cross in this image, and it does seem to get into the kind of Western theories of the atonement. Um, and again, the, the Orthodox have a canonical statement from a council of Constantinople in the 11th century where the, the atonement applies to each person, the Holy Trinity. But you would never get that doctrine from this image right here because it's the Father grasping um, this cross, one, one hand above and one hand below. So yeah. you kind of see the almost echoes of that uh, Trinitarian doctrine of who did Christ die for, you know, the whole Holy Trinity. Uh, but it's really kind of taken away when you see, well, the father's in control of this. He's grasping this cross. So it's a, it's an in, interesting, subtle detail. Like you said, the theological um, presuppositions find themselves manifested in the art. Um, and so it's it's an interesting aspect of this piece right here. Yeah. And so anyway... Other than art review, let me ask you uh, this question. Did the portrayals of the father and his appearance as an old man lead to a resurgence of anti-Trinitarian heresies, right? Like you said, they show the father creating Adam and Eve. It's sort of like he supplants uh, Jesus Christ as the focal point of Christian importance. And, um, you know, lo and behold, we start getting Unitarians. We start getting Jehovah's Witnesses. We start getting, you know, resurgences of heresies that, the canonical art of the past has reflected those have, those have gone away. And so do you think that's a, a, a good connection to make that like images like this will lead to those future uh, Trinitarian heresies? Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, I would, I would say that the appearance of images of God, the father or the Trinity in Western medieval art and later on uh, did provoke um, did provoke among certain people and and even in the, the the heresies of the Middle Ages there's always been an element of uh, iconoclasm and one of the critics uh, critiques they uh, who they already had a, a sort of anti uh, Trinitarian uh, theology and they saw in various churches western uh, medieval churches you know images of god the father and uh they said that's uh you know you god is is above all and and here you have a picture of him i mean what is what is that that doesn't or you have you have three men there are some some images of three men sitting on a throne uh, sometimes they're all the same sometimes not and uh, it it gives it gives the impression that there that we believe we're th we're tritheists we believe actually in three gods, and and people who react against that, you know how do you how do you uh, react against that imagery? Well, you reject the Trinity altogether, and you end up with some kind of Unitarianism or uh, you know Islam. Uh, Judaism, of course, one one person in God, whereas we say uh, there are three persons. But the 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 really interesting thing is that in in the first millennium, in the ecumenical art that I've we've been talking about, there are no images of God the Father. The only acceptable um, image of God is in is the incarnation of christ and so the 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 invisibility the inaccessibility all those negative words that we use in talking about about god all of that is preserved and what we see in an icon of christ is uh, the incarnation in the visible aspects of his humanity we don't we don't see uh, uh, we don't have an image of uh, of the Logos himself or of the Father, or the Holy Spirit, or all three of them together. What we see in an icon is the person of the Logos represented in the visible aspects of his humanity. God the Father didn't become our incarnate. The Holy Spirit was not incarnate. 
They have no visible aspects. So how how can you? And there there I would say we have we have a heretical icon uh, by painting God the Father his his icon. You are saying, what are you saying? You are saying that he had visible aspects. What kind of, what kind of a Trinity or Trinitarian theology is that? Well, that's not our tr theology anyway. Uh, it's it's you know, interesting because in the Council of Nicaea too, where they talk about a lot of art, including um, these kind of uh, hung statues of the Holy Spirit. There's no indication that they were venerated in the uh, um First canon of Nicaea II doesn't decree that uh, such icons be made or such images of the Holy Spirit be made. Um, but the there's no mention of images of the Father. It just seems like everyone was un oh. unaware of their existence. No, um, not at all. But, but we have this image here was shared with me. And if I think it's a 10th century manuscript and it, it's really small, I'm sure, in your screen. But what we see there at the top right is, it looks like um, Christ is a cross in the halo, and there is an old man with just a normal halo, and he's sitting on his lap. And so pretty much like an ancient of days sort of scenario. Um, so we kind of start seeing this creeping in, but it never really gets very widespread um, in the Eastern tradition. But it's not that it has no precedent whatsoever, just like like I mentioned in the Seventh Council. Uh, they mentioned the existence of Holy Spirit, you know, statuary that kind of hangs from the ceilings. Uh, they weren't, you know, unaware of their existence. They didn't really fully endorse it. It's kind of like an ambivalent, you know, mentioning of it. Um, but it's, we see stuff like this, and it does make me think of this. Could it be argued that the West indirect experience of iconoclasm, right, their unenthusiastic reception of Canon 82 outside of uh, Italy, and their overall greater diversity, like, uh, you know, they, they had some statuary uh, pre-schism right around the schism. Does that betray that the theological artistic canon was not closed in the West like it was in the East? Well, if you take uh, Romanesque art, and it lasted for a couple hundred years, um, I would say that it uh, it was, well, again, my explanation of this, that once once the canon was was pretty much solidified, crystallized, then it was uh, reproduced in each country and according to ah yes that's uh that's in a an abbey in france um ah, or is that charlemagne can you do you know oh, that, that statue that statue is uh a reliquary of saint foy yes yes okay that's the one yeah. that's the one in 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 france that caused a lot of uh uh questioning at the time because it's a it's a three-dimensional statue and they the at that time it looks like a pagan idol. Well, like, that's honest. what a lot of that's what a lot of people said because it was that's, three dimensional. That's what it looks like. Uh, how can you tell? Uh, how can you tell it's uh, Saint uh, Saint Foy there? Well, anyway, it it did create some uh, controversy at the time, but not enough to to stop the 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 movement. Um, I would say, uh, well, I got, what was your question before that? Well, it's, it seems to me the West was turning out uh, pieces of art, like what we see here, could, and they weren't really enthusiastic with Canon 82 of Trullo. So, no. like, could it be argued that the, the canonical norm of ecumenical art never was fully solidified in the West? Well, I, it, uh, yeah, okay. I would say that it was, and Romanesque art for two, three hundred years is not just for you know a little time. There, you got you got a, a range of several centuries where uh, Romanesque architecture and Romanesque paintings and art, uh, you know, that was the standard. That was the standard. Then there was the change that came in and went to Gothic, and so I, I think. I don't think there was, you could see much of a development or at least uh, 
uh, I don't know. Um, it's it, it, Romanesque art seems to be fairly stable. Except, and then the 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 Gothic period with uh, a scholastic theology comes in, and then that starts to change uh, in get expressed uh, in the art. But up to the time of uh, in the time of Romanesque art, to the year about well, it depends on the country, 1200, 1100. Um, it, it's pretty much, uh, it's pretty much stable, I would say. Um, and, and so the, statues the, like this would have been the exceptions, the beginning of a oh, disease. Yeah. And, oh yeah, so, certainly. And that's why it, it caused, uh, that's why it caused, uh, criticism at the time. Uh, some people would say, well, look, everything, everything in, um, in Romanesque art is either flat, you know, just like us, you know, two-dimensional, or it's bas-relief. It's, it's not a three-dimensional statue, but it's like carved, an image that is carved and stands out a little bit. That's, that's as far as, as I say, the, uh, the ecumenical art goes. Um, even, even in the fronts of cathedrals and big churches, you know, they would have carvings, but they would always be bas-relief, just standing out from this flat surface, but never three-dimensional. Um, and, and I also think, like, uh, there's a difference between what's a decoration on the outside of a church and what is actually the object of veneration. Because there seems to be the greater allowance for things that are... Uh, um, you know, let's say whether they're three dimensional or or very ornate, but they're decorations. They're not really serving the purpose of veneration. Well, I I would. Uh, that's a good point. I now, if you're thinking in terms of the Gothic cathedrals, of course they have gargoyles and all kinds of various, uh, which I guess would be you could you could classify them as you know decoration. I don't think in an in an orthodox setting, though, whether you have images inside or outside, uh, an image of Christ wherever you see it is an image of Christ, and and uh, needs to be treated as an image of Christ. Uh, I, I'm not sure that distinction is applicable applicable to uh, orthodox canonical art. Now, that's a good question. I would want to. I mean, think of the think, think so of the. It does seem to be in, um, like in Serbia and in Russia. It's not that there's no statues of anything anywhere, but they don't seem to be the object of, you know, of veneration per se, of like actual yeah. religious veneration. It's a, it's an interesting thing. Now, let me. Here's a hot take of yours that comes up in your book. So I want you to be able to defend the notion, um, and uh, really test your thesis. What do we make of Oriental Orthodox to this day having similar art but a different theology? So how do we? Because you say yeah. the art show, the art conveys theology, right? So but they have That's a different my, theology. So how do they have similar my, art? My yeah, the basic thesis is that behind uh, behind the images, behind the actual paintings and stuff, is is the theology, and there's a relationship of. Uh, representation now that's a very good point and i i came now if you if you make an, a study and look at um non-calcedonian images of christ for example and the the difference theological differences between us and them has always been on the question you know like two natures one nature two natures of christ if you take a look at their images of christ throughout history they, they it's very difficult to see any uh serious difference uh among them you do get you get the impression that well egyptian art or coptic art or armenian art uh, even ethiopian art uh, and they're all non-calcedonians if my theory is correct, then the, then the difference in theology should re be reflected in the art, and that doesn't seem to be the case. Well, now what? Other than I, Christ I, holds one finger. 
<laughs> well, okay, one finger. You don't see that. He does hold up one finger instead of two. Ah, bon. uh, <clears throat> Well, he holds up his whole hand, actually. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, uh, the point is that that's a good test for my theory. Apparently, my th the, the reality is not upheld, does not uphold what the theory should predict. Well, you know, I can't let that go. I got to, <laughs> I have to figure out a way to save my theory. So, <laughs> I mean, that every, everybody does that. And, but the, the thing I came up with, I don't, I think is, is, is really good. Now, if in our time, in the last 50, 7,500 years, you know, there've been ecumenical talks between the ortho, uh, uh, Chalcedonian Orthodox, that's us, and the non-Chalcedonian Orthodox, the Copts and the Syriacs and uh, Armenians and, uh, <clears throat> and others. And we, at, at one meeting anyway, they came to the conclusion, everybody didn't accept that, but they came to the conclusion that the differences in Christology between our two churches is not one of substance, of fundamental theology, but is one of vocabulary. Now, if that is the case, and they really do not have a fundamentally different theology just expressed in different terms that would mean that we share we share the same christology and the fact that we do oh, not fingers. see huh <laughs> they get yeah. different numbers of fingers <laughs> okay fingers uh what did uh, the 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 woman there in the picture of uh, the russian picture the old old believer she's you know she's there with, with two fingers uh, uh, anyway uh, <clears throat> But it, maybe maybe yeah. the similarity of the of the images of Christ in the Chalcedonia and non are, are a way of saying that yes, that is in fact the case, that our theologies are more verbal than actually substantial. Ah, I like that because I've I've been very much I've been very much in favor of of a reconciliation with the non Chalcedonians. So far that hasn't happened, but anyway. That's how I. It's probably the best show ever done on this channel is Nicaea 2025, and we we brought on a Roman Catholic, myself as the Eastern Orthodox, an Oriental Orthodox, and a Syrian Orthodox, and eventually we brought on Anglicans. And what came of this Nicaea 2025? What one would see is that the Assyrians, the Oriental Orthodox, and the Eastern Orthodox are very very close other than obviously on pretty much the 5th and 6th centuries and the division the over Chalcedon, right? Otherwise, all their presumptions, all their religious orthopraxies, pretty much identical. Roman Catholics, it seemed like as long as you could skate around the Pope issue, the only non-negotiable was the Pope stuff. Yeah. And once you bring on the Anglicans, even though they're theoretically have a, a Episcopal um, and a, an episcopacy and a, an apostolic succession through that, their their whole worldview is so radically different. You can't even really have the same conversation, right? They're 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 on another planet. It, yeah, you know, yeah. they're on another planet. The Roman Catholics, or at least the moon revolving around that planet, and on the same planet appears to be the Assyrians, the Oriental, and the Eastern Orthodox. Yeah, and so. What's interesting, though, is I found the Anglicans were by far closest to the Roman Catholics than, and if if not even probably closer to the Roman Catholics in many respects than they were to everyone else, which kind of conveys why the art is similar, why they've gone in dissimilar di directions, and why everyone else has it. And so it's a it's an interesting show. It's worth people looking at because it's a non ecumenical discussion. I'm out of full disclosure, not an ecumenist, but we had a respectable conversation and you could actually see where things are in common and where they are different. And like you said, because there's these similarities in art, it does convey there's a lot of similar presuppositions that exist among these different um, Eastern Christendoms as compared to 
Western Christendom. So it's a, it's an intriguing thesis in that respect. Um, here's my last question, and then we'll open up the audience questions. Um, early Christian art in the East, up until the 15th century, mostly, um, would avoid images of the Trinity or the Father. Now, images of the Father now, though not ubiquitous, are really not rare anymore. So what if a person attacking Eastern Orthodoxy would say, based on your thesis, that the Eastern Orthodox have abandoned the canon of, the, of ecumenical art? What are the theological ramifications of this, in your view? Well, I would agree that some of, that during the period of uh, what I call decadence, uh, the Western captivity, uh, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, part of 20th century. Uh, yeah, the, uh, our Orthodox painters, I hesitate to call them, uh, our iconographers, uh, they, they simply adopted, because they had an inferiority complex, they simply adopted the theories and the artistic techniques of, of the West and painted icons, supposed icons, uh, you know, that were sort of half Renaissance and half iconography. They, they, were, they were too orthodox to completely abandon everything, uh, but they were sufficiently uh, westernized in their theology and, their, uh, and in their painting to create what I call hybrid, uh, sort of combining the two and be, neither being one or the other. And that uh, certainly we can see that is an abandoned uh, abandonment of uh, we almost lost, whether it's in the, the Slavic or the Greek or Arabic, or we almost lost the iconic tradition because of this uh, inferiority complex vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the, the West. Uh, and uh, it's only in hmm, the 20th century, huh? now we're still living that, uh, this renewal that uh, you know, on the theological level and on the artistic level that uh, we have say, look, uh, you know, I mean, Italy and uh, the Latin, Latin Middle Ages and Plotina, uh, Thomas Aquinas and all the guys, you know, that's not our standard. That's not our roots. Our roots aren't there. Our roots are in the patristic holy tradition of the fathers. And uh, and it's a return. It's a return now, uh, the renewal time, a return to canonical, uh, uh, canonical images and also a return to the theology of the fathers. Um, and we almost lost it. I mean, in, in, in Russia, uh, you know, the, the official, who, 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 pre who pre preserved uh, what we call today canonical or images? Who preserved that in, in Russia, in Tsarist Russia? It wasn't, the, it wasn't the Church of Moscow. It wasn't the Academy, uh, the Royalist Academy in Moscow or Leningrad. It was the old believers. Isn't that ironic? The, the so-called heretics or bad guys are the ones that preserve canonical orthodoxy and the so-called good guys in Moscow, St. Petersburg and the Tsar and all that, the, all, all of them, they were the ones promoting, oh, everything Western, Peter the Great, you know, everything, get rid of the beards and, and uh, bring in uh, all kinds of everything that's Western. Anything Western is good. Anything that is Russian is bad, and of course, part of that Russianism was traditional orthodoxy, and uh, we almost lost it. But thank goodness the roots were alive uh, and vibrant, and it just needed a, a change in climate, and those roots have uh, have produced. And, and ironically, uh, Stalin destroyed a lot of churches with the with that art. It's uh, <laughs> there. You go. There it, you it's go. true, though. I go. mean, that's really what happened. Um, and so a lot of that art has disappeared forever. Um, in Maypack, New York, there's a hermitage of uh, Our Lady of Kursk, if I remember right. I want to get the right city. I don't think it's Kiev. But point is, there's a hermitage. It's in Rokor. And it's like a museum of all this westernized art that they were able to save out of Russia, right? 
and it's all in this like one hermitage. You could you could visit me a pack, my whole pack if you want to spell it. New York. Where is this? Where is this? And well, if you ever come down, I'll take you there. That's my hometown. Ah, okay. All right. It's, uh, that's my hometown. So it's a, I don't live there now, but it's a, it's in Mahopak, New York. And you, as an art historian, would find this fascinating because it's all in one place. And of uh, Lika John Shaw's there. It's very accessible. So anyway, it's all this art here, art there. And you, and if you walk into any other Russian church, like in Rokor, you, you just won't see that. And it shows there's been a, a real change, uh, a return to form per se. Um, and we can see this as the as the grace of God kind of correcting things artistically within the church. And so it's, but there's no exaggerating. It really started kind of going off the rails for a bit um, in in Russia uh, in particular. So it's a, it's an interesting thing. I even say I have a saying. Uh, you know, there are some Orthodox churches that are covered inside, covered with paintings, but there aren't any icons in them. What? It's covered with religious paintings, but there are no icons? Well, that's because they were painted when everybody thought, oh, they were all looking to East, Western Europe and, uh, you know, icons in the Italian style. Wow. Thank you. I prefer uh, icons in the style of the of the fathers of the church. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to do plugs and do some audience questions. Oh, okay. So I'm going to plug your website. I'm going to click present. And guys, if you want to get more of Father Stephen, you're going to have to learn a little bit of French because his name in French is Stefan Big Head. Ah. Yeah. So if you go to Stefan, Stefan, there I am. There I am. S T E P H A N E, or to make it like a Stefan Big Ham, if you really want to spell it phonetically. If you go to StefanBigHam.com, you will be able to get more from Father Stephen. It even has to spell the his name there. There you go. <laughs> That's the English side. There's a, if you want to see it in French, you go punch on the French side. That's right. It's, uh, Father Stephen's gone native. He's become a, a true Quebecan. <laughs> and you can get his books and everything here at uh, stephanbigham.com. Um, my plug is orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. If you want to support the parishes in Cambodia, that is the easiest way. It also gives the link directly to the Moscow Patriarchate's website. Uh, so if this has blessed you, Please bless someone else because I'm not aware of anyone going this deep into art history uh, and orthodoxy uh, in an online stream. So if this has blessed you, please bless someone else at orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. It's a new month. We'd appreciate your donations so we could send your donations to Cambodia. So now let's get to those audience questions. And uh, it's kind of slow here, lovely technology. We're, we'll get there, fine. We'll get there. Here we go. So we got some questions and comments. We got this from Take Back Constantinople. He's a Romanian who loves his Western art. He says, Romanesque icons are totally Orthodox, and they have their place in the Orthodox Church. Well, you'd be happy to know that that's exactly what Father Stephen said. Ryland said, Yay! Yay! <laughs> Hit that like button if you haven't. So there you go. That's, that's Ryland. <laughs> Mella says, can you talk about Pieta? What's Pieta? I don't know, Father. Uh, Pieta is that's the at Michelangelo's uh, statue of uh, Mother of God holding the dead Christ. It's in Rome. I think it's in Rome. The Pieta. It's a uh, well. It's a it's statuary. Uh, it's three dimensional, yeah. and uh, it, it, it you have to distinguish between it's beautiful. It's beautiful. You know, it's in the talent that that was needed to create that. Wow, you know, <clears throat> Michelangelo was a great uh, artist. Okay, but from our point of view, from the point of view of icons, of course, well, you know, it's not uh, Mary, Mary, and the Mother of God, and ah, there it is. Uh, you know, shown in the in the light of the kingdom of God. So, uh, you know, it's shown, it's a woman holding a dead man. 
uh, could be, actually it could be anybody. Uh, I mean, we know we recognize it as, as the Pieta, but the actual form of what is shown is a young woman holding a dead man. A gigantic uh, young woman. She's bigger than... It, it, yes, it's very big. And, and look, look how, how intricately all that is, is, is sculpted uh, marble, I think. Uh, you know, hard stone. I mean, it's a, it's a wonder. Uh, it's magnificent. Uh, but, you know, it's not, it's not iconic. There's so be uh, careful. To... It's a beautiful piece of art, like you're saying. Um, oh, it's a, yeah. It's sort of, here's things where I can see that are wrong, wrong with it, because I think that's why someone wants to comment on the Pieta. Let me start with what's right. Um, I do think where it shows that Theotoko, she doesn't look happy, but she has a certain self-control over her grief. Um, that is something we do see in sacred tradition, that she did experience grief, but God healed it of her. And uh, again, the Theotokos, yeah. um, not having sinned, did not uh, grieve in a way that was excessive and not controlled. Um, so we could see that there in this image and in good icons, because um, there's some that kind of exaggerate the grief aspect. And, and oh, yeah. some good icons, the Theotokos, the cross, we see this in the Orthodox tradition as well. We also see Christ. Um, a kind of peaceful look in his death, um, yeah. which again detracts from what we were seeing in some of the other art, where it, it can magnify the the uncontrollable, inconsolable pain that Christ was in. We don't really see that there. So that's stuff where I'd look at that and, and say that's correct. I would say though, here's what we see wrong: this large, otherworldly Theotokos. Um, not only is she the wrong age, a young woman. Not only is she historically gigantic. Um, when her tomb, she's only four and a half feet tall. So we actually know how big she was because we archaeologically have her tomb it still exists. It's a place of veneration. So totally detached from history, it almost turns her into a god. And uh, this is something that with the, what will come with the Immaculate Conception, with these false Mariological doctrines, these, they end up minimizing Christ. They, they make him a man of passions. They make him almost lesser than his mother, and this image does convey that. It does convey this kind of magnification to Theotokos, but magnified in the wrong directions, which the West would ultimately go with her. And as we could see, that's why the Protestants end up uh, really revolting, uh, revolting against uh, a lot of these ideas, because look how it's portrayed to them, right? And gorgeous, if we're gonna speak of just art as a form, and go gorgeous images like this, um, but like you said, detached from Orthodox doctrine in some respects and uh, detached from Orthodox iconography. So there you go. That's the Pieta, guys. <laughs> uh, what would you say uh, in that in, in the Pieta, uh, what identifies, how do you identify Mary and Jesus? What tells you that this those those two figures are a statue of Mary and Jesus? In an icon of Christ and the Mother of God, you you've got a whole list of things. You know the icon, the halo, the cross, uh, her own, uh, his name, all kinds of stuff. Her name. That ah, there's the that's the identity. There's none of that in in the Pieta to to identify who those people are. Now we have uh, this here from a topic, and that is true because again, that's one of the. Things actually required by Nicaea too, totally gone once we have statuary. You're just supposed to presume who these people are. You said the images are supposed to be identified canonically. Atomic Lead says, E. Michael Jones, a bonneville papal wig history with respect to the post schism death of Western iconography, hasn't been blown the heck out yet. Who is E. Michael Jones? I don't get I'm guessing I don't know. I'll let the audience answer that question. <laughs> I, I don't I don't know the name. There we go. We got this from John, the MC. There is perspective, but it's portrayed from more than one viewpoint. The vanishing point is not located on the plane of the icon board, but rather it's behind the person viewing the icon. Could you give us some uh, perspective on that comment, Father? Yeah, uh, th that's that's right. There is, it's not that there is not linear perspective in some icons, 
there are that it does exist but there are other kinds of perspective too that that break uh break the 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 this worldly uh appearance of the of the icons in an in an icon if you look very closely all the action should take if it's a, a an event all the action should take place as though it's on the front of a stage you know a theater stage with the curtain pulled and there's usually a little uh hemisphere a little rounded edge between the curtain and the uh empty space <clears throat> An, an icon is very similar to that in that the action takes place on that little strip of wood jet with a with a curtain in back and it's very upfront with no depth with no uh perspective or one kind of perspective dominating so he, he, that's uh, that, that's very uh, very true what what this fellow said there now we have this also from John, the sublime perfect example or pinnacle of West European authentic iconography is Jan and Hubert von Eyck's of the Lamb St. Bava altarpiece of Ghent 1432. I'm just gonna present it on screen for everyone. I just think it looks terrible in all honesty. <laughs> I'm not uh, sure. I think I know what I think I know what you're gonna show. Yeah, I'm it just it I'm, looks terrible. Um the, right. the non-canonical uh, lamb yeah, yeah. and it's just, the linear perspective yeah. in this one, we can even people want to know what linear perspective is. It's what all the, the all the lines, if you could draw lines and image, all converge in a central point. It gives something yeah. a feeling of true three dimensions. And we can see yeah. that here where the Holy Spirit is, that those uh, the light shining down, that's the, the linear perspective. So you have an authentic depth that even the fountain below you could see conforms to the linear perspective of uh, the for the background conforms to those 3D buildings, linear perspective. We we see very modern looking people um, here, um, wearing modern clothing. Uh, we see modern looking cities in the background. It's truly and very plainly showing crisis in our midst right now, but this totally not very orthodox in any way. So <laughs> there it well, is. There, there, there is uh, Canon 82 uh of uh of kinesex there's the lamb the lamb of god and where where is christ where is jesus incarnate in this image we have the lamb and john the baptist someplace pointing to him and the lamb has been pierced but there's no i i can't see anything that would be jesus himself on yeah, the altar it's interesting. It's the Western art devolved back into being very cryptic again, right? It's uh, one would have to have a lot of knowledge of what exactly is going on here and what it is to know. Yeah, this is just a a cryptic way of portraying Christ. And uh, you mentioned before, uh, which is quite true, uh, the West uh, Western Christianity um, did not adopt. Uh, Canon 82 uh, and the and the theology, not not just images. Again, here we have images with the theology behind them. What's the difference between a lamb and an icon of Jesus? Well, it's the whole relationship between symbols in the Old Testament, prefigurations, and the fulfillment in the actual person of, of Jesus. So that there is a hierarchy uh, between our understanding of symbols and an image, an icon, which is a direct representation of the hypostasis, another big word, meaning the person, the person represented. And the church said, well, all of those Old Testament symbols, the lamb and all that, we don't throw them out. I mean, they're not bad, but they're of a previous stage. Now we, Christians, we are in the stage of the fulfillment of all those uh, images. We're in the we're in the age of the incarnation, and so we can have an image of uh, of God in His uh, visible. Uh, what happened? Something fell in the background. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we. 
We got this. We have, uh, I don't like modern depictions of Jesus anymore. They are so lacking, especially after experiencing compassion from icons. I, I want to show one image, and I do not endorse the artist. If people know who Caravaggio is, uh, or Caravaggio, however you pronounce his name. Yeah, now, Caravaggio. It, Caravaggio. So this is the calling of St. Matthew. And what oh, I love like no, about no. it, it's uh, the, the, you, it brings light out, like a Thomas Kincaid picture, like an Orthodox icon, the bringing out of light. We well, can see it in the picturing of everyone. Uh, that makes it too big. St. Matthew here, dressed very much like a hoodlum of the day, right? That Christ <laughs> is calling people in, the, in this day. Um, right now, yeah. Christ is calling you. So it's it's very beautiful in what it's portraying. I'm not sure I wouldn't kiss this art. There's nothing about it that demands you to venerate it, which is what I would say the orthodox defect. But you could see the um, just the masterpiece of how well the windows painted and how realistic it's partly you know it's partly opened uh, the shutters partly opened and just how distraught St. Matthew is and how Christ is calling him. I and mean, that means he's calling us despite us being sinful. It's uh, a very, very good painting. It serves a very good purpose. So that's why, like, uh, the point of this video is not, like, oh, all Western art's going to give you the heebie-jeebies. That, that's really not the point. There's redeeming aspects of some of this art. I mean, a lot of it's gone off the rails, come really, truly awful. Um, but uh, I see something redeeming in this, but it doesn't seem to be something that really demands veneration. There's nothing about this which would, yeah. like Nicaea too would say, is a window into heaven. So I know you're we, feeling we, 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 we have to always make a distinction. This kind of art by Caravaggio or uh, any of the other great artists, they were great, talented artists. Look what, look what he produced. This is this is magnificent. Uh, it's really good. I mean, as a as an expression of art, he created something very beautiful. But from our point of view, the point of view of of Orthodox iconography, the Christian tradition of uh, of of the ecumen of ecumenical art, we don't judge that picture Caravaggio by our standards. I mean, any more than our icon should be judged by Caravaggio standards. They're two different, two different things. And uh, I can say it's beautiful. I, it's really great. It certainly is not iconic. It certainly would not, we couldn't put it in an, or you shouldn't, in an Orthodox church, and you would not go up and venerate it. But for what it is and what it claims to be, and that is a painting of the calling of St. Matthew, is that it? Uh, you know, ah, bravo, that's great, but it's not what we have. And when you, during his in history, when those two things started to get mixed, uh, secular art and uh, and everything with icons, then we get into trouble. If you can, you go back to the uh, to the Caravaggio. picture. I just want to show you. It's gone yeah. forever. <laughs> okay, so, okay. No more Caravaggio. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. But we see this. We're just, uh, Orthodox Boomer Grandma says, we're just a spectator, like in the Caravaggio painting. No invitation to communion with the divine. And, and I well, think that there that really go. sums it up in a nutshell, right? Like you're seeing something beautiful, you know? And there is a sort of invitation to follow Christ, but it's, but it's the idea. It's not that the art really spiritually draws you in, which I think you, you see in true Orthodox iconography. Um, you wouldn't want to kiss it and place your head on it and and cry praying to it. There's nothing about that Caravaggio painting, no matter. I think that might be one of the most beautiful paintings ever made on a, in an objective sense, um, where it would serve the purposes of, of Orthodox iconography. Uh, oh, another another thing, uh, like with the Pietà, if you if you just if you showed Caravaggio that painting to Joe Blow on the street. Or you know somebody from Japan or a Martian or whatever, and said, "What is this? What is this a picture of?" Pirates. Would he? You would know. Would that person? <laughs> would that person say, "Oh, there's Jesus"? I mean, what in that image, in that painting? 
identifies Jesus as Jesus. If you don't have, if you have no idea about that, you would, you know, well, I don't know. It looks like there's a table and men and somebody over here and there's a, a light shining down a window. I, I don't know. Uh, but it's, the, the, the point was not to paint uh, Christ so that he is obviously identifiable in the canonical characteristics. Uh, and so I, I think people would have, even people who are, uh, you know, who know something about art, would look and say, well, that's Jesus. How do you know that? Well, because that's supposed to be St. Matthew. Well, how do you know it's St. Matthew? Well, because that's the title. <laughs> there you go. Oh, they, they put the, they that's put how I know it. it. <laughs> they put his name on yeah. it. Next. <laughs> well, the name is on the bottom on the card in the museum. You know, this is a painting by Caravaggio, uh, Matthew Calling of Matthew. Blah, blah, blah. So, oh, so you look for Matthew. And if Matthew's there, there's probably Jesus. But this is, it's not because it jumps out at you. Well, Father, this this has been a excellent show. We've covered so much. I think a lot of people that even not into art will have, will have learned a lot about the role of authentic Christian art and images. And it's uh, it's something where I am just happy after so many months that we've been finally able to put this together. So I just want to give my thanks and thanks to the audience for you joining us and and discovering so many so much of this in detail for us. It's uh, always my pleasure. I love to shoot my mouth off. There, there you go, Father. So do I. Well, Father, I'm <laughs> gonna I'm gonna end this show as I end all of them by uh, quoting Jesus Rock and saying, "Fight to death for the truth, and the Lord God will fight for you." God bless you. Very good. Have a good day. Very good. Bye-bye.